Welcome back to Monster Tamer, a 2D Pokemon-like RPG created in Phaser 3. Previously, we worked on adding in our animations uh, for our player game object when it moves around our scene. If you missed the previous videos, there'll be links to the video description to the source code up to this point, as well as clear source code for this video. There'll also be a link to the previous videos if you'd like to catch up, so let's get started. Alright, so next what we're going to do is we're going to update some of the properties tied to our Phaser camera. And what we're going to do is we're going to update our camera to go ahead and have it follow our player game object around our scene. And then that way, as our player moves around, we can explore more of our level. And so to do this, uh, all we have to do is we just need to reference our phaser main camera and we can tell it to follow a particular game object in the scene. And then that way, anytime that game object moves, uh, the camera's position will move to follow that game object. And so doing this is uh, really easy. Um, all we need to do is we need to pass in a reference to our game object for our player sprite. And so to do that, let's come over to our character class. And what we'll do is just going to add a new getter for getting our phaser game object. Uh, so uh, let's just go ahead and copy our logic for one of our getters. We'll go ahead and do sprite. And we're going to return this. And we will do our phaser game object. And let's go ahead and update our type. So we'll have our phaser game objects dot sprite. And then what we can do inside our world scene is after we create our player game object, we can go ahead and pass that reference to our camera. All right, so go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead and reference our phaser scene. We'll go ahead and do the camera's property at our camera manager. We're going to grab our main camera. And then what we'll do is we're going to use the start follow method. And this method allows us to provide our target, so our game object. And so this is going to be our player sprite. And then what this method will do is the camera should start moving to follow our player. And so right away when our scene refreshes, uh, we see right away that we have a different view. And what will happen is when we call this method, what Phaser will do is with the camera is going to go ahead and place that game object in the center of our camera. So it's our, it's our primary focus. And then that way now, as we move around our scene, we see that our camera is actually updating to follow that game object. And now we can actually explore our level as our player moves around. However, uh, one of the downsides of this is with your Phaser scenes, your worlds are kind of infinite uh, in your coordinates. And so even though our level is just this background image here, um, as we move around, we see this black background. Um, and your game objects can keep moving infinitely in that direction. Uh, so both positive and negative for our X and Y coordinate system. And so what we want to do is our game is a defined box, we'll say. And for our level, we only want to keep our camera within that box. And luckily, this is actually really easy to do. Um, we can use a property to go ahead and specify our dimensions for our level. And it will tell Phaser not to leave that box. And then that way, we can kind of hide this black area here and cut off our camera at the edge of our background image here. And so to do that, all we need to do is on our camera, and what we'll do is we'll come to the top of our create method, is we just need to reference our main camera. So we're going to do this cameras.main, and we're going to call the set bounds method. And now this bounds allows you to provide the top left coordinate of your bounding box, so our rectangle. Um, so we want this to be 0, 0 for our top left corner of where our image of our background level is currently rendered at. And now we need to provide the width and the height of where this box, so that we know how big this box will be. And so for our max width, uh, basically this is going to be the dimensions of our background image that we loaded. Uh, so this will be 1,280, and it's going to be 2,176 for our current background image. And so now if we go ahead and save, what should happen is our scene should update, and it looks like it did before. However, our player, now if it moves past that center point in our camera's view here in our scene, what should happen is now our camera updates to follow our player within our bounding box. And so when we are near the edge of one of our bounded areas here, what will happen is your game object is no longer in the center. Uh, but the camera will still follow that game object, but it's going to honor where that edge of that bounding box is. 
But once you move past that point, then your game object becomes the focal point of the camera, and now it's back in the center. And so this is a nice way to get the effect we're looking for, but then also not show that background, that black background, and we stay within the view that we want to show our player. All right, so next what we'll do is we're going to modify the zoom level on our camera. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to zoom in and out on our scene. And then that way the game objects will appear further away or closer depending on what we do. And by zooming uh, and by modifying our zoom level, it's going to allow us to zoom out a little. And then that way uh, our game objects don't appear as big. Uh, so after we call the set bounds method, what we'll do is we'll do this cameras.main. We're going to go ahead and do the set zoom method to go ahead and set the zoom property on our camera. Uh, so typically this is a value of one. And so if we change this to 0 0.8, what that's going to do is it's going to zoom out our camera. And now we get a larger uh, view. We, we see more of our level inside our scene here. And our game object's a little bit smaller, and it just makes our game look uh, a lot nicer. Likewise, we can also zoom in. So if we like magnify this to two, what our camera is going to do is going to really zoom in on that area. And now everything is twice as big. Um, however, I think everything else is still honored. So we still have our bounds and our camera is still going to follow our game object. All right, so one last method we're going to take a look for our camera is going to be the center on method. And so what the center on method does is it allows you to provide a position of where you want your camera to center on, and that's going to be its focus point. And so this method allows you to manually move your camera and have it focus on a particular area of your game. And so this is really nice for like creating cutscenes and things like that. Uh, but one thing to note is once you have your camera start following a game object, that's going to take precedence over where you have its focus when you center on a particular point. Uh, so just to see an example, what we're going to do is we're going to comment out this line here so we won't follow our player. And then what we're going to do is we're going to copy this line here after we set our zoom and we're going to call the center on method. And so the center on method expects an X and Y position of where you want it to focus. And so for this, uh, we're just going to do X and Y. And what we'll do is we're going to make two new variables. We'll do const X equals. And so we're going to use our grid uh, positioning. Uh, so we're going to say uh, six on our grid. We're going to multiply that by our tile size. Y, we're going to go ahead and set this equal to 22. And we're going to go ahead and multiply that by our tile size. And so what this does is for this position, our camera is now going to focus on that point. Um, so this is a really good, helpful method if you need to find a position of like where you want to place game objects. Um, but it's also really helpful for like if you want to do cutscenes. So what we could do in our game is when our scene starts, we could show our town area here, we could have our NPCs moving around, and then like our player character could come out of the house. And then like once that happens, then our player would gain control of the character. Um, or we could even do more with the cutscene. Uh, we could have someone, an NPC walk up to the door, show them entering, um, wh whatever we want to do. And so with the center on method, this makes it easy to update the position of our camera um, to have it focus on a particular point. Um, but like I said, one thing to keep in mind is once you have your camera start following the game object, it's going to go ahead and focus on that object. Uh, so it looks like nothing's happening here, but this, is, but this sets us up later uh, for where we want to add in that cutscene functionality. All right, and so lastly, what we're going to do is we're going to update the position of our player game object, because right now we're out of bounds on our current level. And what we want to do is actually start at that house that we just looked at. And so to do that, we'll update our position to be 6, 21. If we go ahead and save, now our character is outside that house. All right, so before we wrap up, we're just going to do a few minor things. Uh, the first one is we are going to go ahead and add a fade-in effect to our world scene. And then that way we have a nice transition, kind of like how we did in our battle scene. Uh, so what we'll do is at the bottom of our create method in our world scene, after we create our controls, let's go ahead and reference our cameras. We'll get the main, and let's go ahead and add in a fade-in effect. And we'll keep it uh, relatively simple. So we're just going to do a duration of one second. And we'll do 0, 0, 0 for our RGB, so that way we'll fade in from black. So now when our scene starts, we get this nice fade-in effect. 
um, for when our level loads. And then that way, as we transition between our battle scene and this scene, I will have those nice fade effects. All right, so with that, it actually wraps up our camera and our world scene changes for now. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and switch gears and do some uh, code alignment. Uh, so previously, when we created our player animations, uh, we started a new method for adding our animations to this JSON file. Um, however, some of our existing code actually creates these manually inside their classes, and that's going to be our attacks. Um, just to keep everything aligned, what we're going to do is we're going to move our attacks we're going to move our attacks JSON to this file as well. Uh, so what we'll do real quick is let's jump over to our ice shard and our slash attack uh, classes. And we're going to grab that code for creating those animations and come back to our animations JSON file and we'll go ahead and paste it. Uh, so inside our slash, let's go ahead and get rid of that logic there. Then in our ice shard, we'll grab our two animations. And let's go ahead and remove those as well. And then back in our animations JSON, we'll go ahead and paste those in. And so what we need to do is we just need to go ahead and create our animation object. So let's go ahead and copy our player up. We're going to paste it three times and we'll go ahead and update our names. Uh, so we'll go ahead and grab ice shard start. Go ahead and paste that here for our key. We'll also do that for our asset key. Uh, for our properties, we have a frame rate of eight. So we will go ahead and change that. Uh, we don't want a repeat, so we're gonna set that to zero. Uh, delay, we don't use yo-yo for these animations. And then what we need to do is we don't actually need to provide our frames because we use the whole sprite sheet animation. And then what we'll do is let's just copy this one here. We're gonna go ahead and paste it. And we'll change this to ice shard. And we'll keep the same properties. All right, and then so now we just gotta do slash. So for slash, we're gonna go ahead and paste that here. Actually, let's copy this because it has a similar configuration. And then we'll go ahead and paste slash. And then what we'll do is we'll update our frame rate to be four. And we can go ahead and get rid of this code here. Get rid of our comma. Let's go ahead and save. And since we just refactored some of our code, we just want to make sure everything's working properly. So let's go ahead and come to our config. Uh, skip battle animations to set to false. Perfect. And what we'll do is come to our preload scene. And what we'll do is instead of going to a world scene, let's go to our battle scene. We'll go ahead and save. And let's just validate that our attacks still work properly. All right, so our battle shows up. We do our fight. If we do our slash, we see our slash animation. Perfect. And now we should see our ice shard, our two animations, and we have our wind up and then our attack. Nice. All right, so back in our preload scene, let's go ahead and revert this back to world scene. All right, with that, that actually brings this video to an end. In our next video, we're going to focus on adding collisions uh, between our player game object and some of the objects in our scene. Uh, so we'll be using it, the data in our level JSON file uh, to check for these possible collisions. Uh, so as a reminder, there's a link in the description of the video to the complete source code for this video. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. If you did enjoy the video, please consider liking the video and hitting the bell icon to be notified when the next video in the series is released. For more great phaser 3 content please see the links on your screen now